So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Festival of Enterprise Bounce Back Live webinars for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And today I'm joined by a special entrepreneur, a gentleman called Cohen Jansen, um, and he's tuned in all the way from Amsterdam for us. And he's going to be talking about the thing, the the Internet of Things, um, a concept of making systems and processes better by enabling devices or objects to communicate with each other by an internet connection, which I'm sure, you know, in, in the modern age of lockdown, uh, this is something that you're all very interested about. I know I am because I want to learn how things work together automatically without human intervention. And I'm sure Cohen's going to give us some great insights into how everything works. But first of all, Cohen, what's the weather like in Amsterdam? Yeah, it's rather rainy over here, so thank you for having me. Uh, looks like uh, British weather is not uh, that much different at the moment. But, uh, no, I think I think every time I do come to Amsterdam, it is always very wet. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in Bournemouth. It was really sunny yesterday, but it's very windy and rainy today. So, um, but I'm 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 here with my holiday background. So uh, you know, let's see what happens. Hopefully, the sun might come out and. Uh, I'll be able to go and enjoy some time on the beach. So, Cohen, give us an introduction about yourself and, and how Hyber works. Yes. Perfect. So, thank you so much for having us over, and it's really appreciated. Um, I know we have been on the air about one and a half years ago uh, with one of the other podcasts uh, that is being run. Nonetheless, uh, a short introduction first about myself, which eventually uh, and kind of organically grows over into uh, what Hyber is all about. So I have a background in aerospace engineering, studied here in the Netherlands at Delft University, and found out I was not a typical engineer. So I, uh, I beefed up my uh, financial and business skills at Harvard University and started my career in actually investment banking, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions uh, at one of the larger European banks at the time. Um, from there on, I, uh, I did a bit of strategic consultancy before I was running into several angel investors here in Amsterdam. And they basically said, Kuhn, we want to make money in the aerospace uh, market. We see that the industry is changing from a government and institutionally run industry, and that's changing around to a real commercial uh, opportunity. That's all we know, so we want you to join uh, and see how we, uh, you know, can make money in this uh, in this new and exciting uh, time for the space industry. Well, with my background uh, as an aerospace engineer by studies or by education, uh, but also the investment side of uh, of my professional career, we actually started with investing in several uh, um, new space uh, companies. That was the first year, about seven or eight investments being done. And uh, by that time, we really learned where the opportunity was. And uh, we have seen the, the research markets uh, as well regarding, you know, Internet of Things, where back at the days, everyone was making jokes about, you know, the egg boiler talking to your, uh, to your fridge to, uh, to order new ones. Um, but actually, over time, um, IoT has come out of its infancy, I would say. And we have seen that as billions and billions of devices need to be connected uh, anywhere in the world, we saw the flaw of uh, GSM coverage, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, you name them. Because basically, although everyone takes it for granted, um, you know, taking the train from where you are right now into London, you will see that GSM coverage is actually not what it's supposed to be. Uh, and so it's similar for the rest of the world. So even less than 10% of the world is actually covered by these uh, terrestrial connectivity uh, solutions that we are all aware of. So we said, can we take that issue and combine it with what is going on uh, with uh, the satellite industry where small satellites are actually taking over um, some of the capabilities, definitely not all, but some of those capabilities. So that is about uh, four years ago, when we uh, started a company that is nowadays called Hyber. Um, so we started really from a commercial opportunity point of view, eventually working together with the European Space Agency to, to show that it was possible to launch our own satellites, which we have done uh, after two years' time. So we have two of our own satellites uh, in space. 
And uh, with that, we basically cover the whole earth at least one times per day. So the majority of the solutions we are uh, providing solutions for nowadays are also based on the fact that, you know, we have a sensor and a modem. I will uh, actually try to pick one of them up here. So we have extremely small uh, modems. You connect that to a small antenna and actually sends the data towards uh, a satellite that is flying over. And as soon as that satellite flies, uh, flies over, it goes back into a sleeping mode. And therefore, the applications on the ground are extremely power efficient. So they can run for five to 10 years in the field without replacing batteries, all that kind of stuff. And this is such a new thing that yeah, it was actually picked up. Uh, we have several awards, and I will not go down all the, the list of uh, things, but there are two things I'm particularly uh, proud of. One of them is that by the time we actually launched our first two satellites at the end of 2018, we uh, got recognized by Amazon with a, uh, an award called the, uh, the Launch of the Year. Uh, it's an award, it's their opening act of their uh, Amazon uh, Web Services reInvent conference with previous winners being Airbnb and Netflix. And you know, we are extremely proud to be in the list of seven companies right now uh, and, and Hyper being one of those. Um, moving forward a bit though, because that is basically where we, uh, where we left off last time we spoke. Um, moving forward, uh, you know, space is a deeply governmental run industry. Uh, I think everyone is aware of that and, and knows the costs that are involved. Uh, they can be uh, gigantic. Nonetheless, uh, our Dutch government is a proud supporter and also recognized us um, as being a national icon. So the way they looked at us is saying, well, the, the Dutch researchers were at the forefront of uh, uh, co-inventing Wi-Fi. Uh, I know Australians are not that uh, not that proud of uh, me saying that, but uh, one of the leaders in those uh, research groups were Dutch people. Uh, Bluetooth also comes from uh, the Dutch grounds, you know, and in that line of thought, um, they really think that putting out a global IoT standard that can be used anywhere in the world is the next, next big thing. So really proud of uh, where we are as a company nowadays. Okay, brilliant. So um, I think w what the audience want to know today is, you know, how does that technology change, you know, where we are right now? So, you know, maybe say pre-March, people probably didn't really see the importance of this, but how has sort of COVID-19 accelerated your business and made a massive difference into, you know, the services you're providing? Yeah, so our general thought is making sure that you can remotely monitor any asset or anything that is within your, well, called asset portfolio. But basically, um, when it comes to the solutions we are providing, it's, it gives all kinds of insights into where your fleet of rail cars is, for example. Um, people are not that much aware of all these things, but simple status updates of saying, hey, I'm here. I'm me, I'm doing good. That is something that the majority of, um, of companies actually want to know about their assets, but they really don't have any clue. So allowing companies and institutions to monitor on a remote basis, that is something that, you know, it's a, an extremely simple and small ID, but the, the opportunity is just massive. So. One of the companies, as I, as I mentioned, is in the uh, the real car uh, monitoring business. And, you know, there are over millions of these kinds of um, real cars that are, people are unaware of where they are and whether they are having hazardous goods with them or not. So we are providing a whole safety net with, um, yeah, these kinds of real cars going in and out of connectivity areas, whereas, because of the importance of the goods, you rather want to know where they are all the time. Now, the same accounts for uh, cows, for example. We always made fun of this at the very beginning. 
Um, but actually knowing where your cow is and where it has been over its whole life, you can go from, you know, from beef to premium beef and therefore uh, get more money uh, while also increasing the, the livelihoods of, of these uh, cattle. And as soon as you start to think in these kinds of ways, yeah, there, the, you cannot stop of the opportunities that Internet of Things brings along. Um, so, you know, one of the other opportunities is uh, you have these pumping jacks that, uh, that produce water or whether it's uh, any kind of uh, energy form. And the industry doesn't really know what the um, performance is of these wells. And that's just as crazy as it gets, right? So you can introduce this to basically any kind of industry. Uh, we are primarily in the in the primary industries because we are in remote areas. Um, but the yeah, just knowing what is happening with uh, your assets can increase profitability or even operational ability to uh, you know three to seven times. I'm not talking about percentages. It's it's like X. And that's the, the thing I like so much about this company that we um, can really push forward. Now, as soon as um, COVID starts roaring around the world, uh, I think company uh, has been impacted one way or another. For us, it's no, uh, yeah, not less than that. Um, so step one is I'm extremely proud with the, the team we have, we, we didn't have to let go of everyone. We paid all salaries, holiday uh, salaries included, etc. I think there are not a whole lot of startups that can uh, say the same. So I'm extremely proud that we as a company were capable of uh, yeah, not letting go of any of the personnel. And even there, we have been hiring, uh, I think we've been growing with 20 to 30% uh, over the past months again, because there's such a need for remote monitoring, which has been, I think, leapfrogged maybe four or five years, while now everybody understands that you know maybe people are not always at the spot that they uh, think they are, but you want to continue to monitor all your assets all the time. Um, even there, so you know when we first were hit, and then we we are really in the process of getting our first customers online, uh, definitely a year ago. So we are in the process of showing that we have product market fit, that our products work, and that they uh, indeed have the benefits that we uh, that we foresee. And then all of a sudden, all our customers, especially the larger ones, are like, okay, let's start focusing on business as usual first before we continue with these kind of um, highly innovative products. So we have seen a bit of a uh, stop and go mentality, so to say. Everything has been delayed for quite some time. Um, nonetheless, uh, things seem to be picking back up again. Uh, I think we have installations ongoing in every continent at this uh, very moment that we're very proud of. And um, yeah, I think most of our customers basically uh, started to believe even faster than than previously that you know. Remote monitoring, and especially the most simple of updates, uh, we're really talking about 144 bytes, basically an SMS or a tweet size message that you can send towards uh, the mission control where you can have all the data available to you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a game changer for many industries, and we're just very proud to enable uh, those solutions for our customers. I mean, COVID-19 has been the whole, you know, the kickstart of remote monitoring. It's been... You know, people saying they didn't want to work from home, you, you know, uh, not being in an office space. We've seen that remote monitoring is the future. And I think, you know, your organization is becoming the future and it's providing businesses with the solutions for the future. Um, you know, what, what are the main plans? Like, where, where do you want to take this? How far can this go? I mean, you talked about all the different industries that, you know, you talked about cows. <laughs> and, I, and I remember watching a Top Gear episode where they went to Australia and there was a cow, there was a cattle ranch which was the size of a city. Uh, and, you, you know, you're talking about monitoring those each individual cows in that massive ranch. Uh, and it's the same in Brazil where you've got massive, massive cattle ranches. But, you know, you've got things like oil. Oil's a massive 
you, you know, the amount of oil that's stolen from pipelines uh, and understanding what's going on. And, and it's really interesting that you talk about it. It's knowing that information and having that information in real time. So, you know, where do you want to grow this? Where, where can you see the end on this? Or, you know, is, is there no end? <laughs> Yeah, so the, as, as mentioned before, the, the opportunity is tremendous, and we are really amazed by um, yeah, basically the opportunity that we spotted really, really early on. Uh, I think four or five years ago, IoT was still in early stage. Um, the first companies making real you know, millions of revenues in there, but still um, the proof for the return on investment, um, yeah, that, that's still a, a hurdle to take. Uh, for most of these companies. And what we have seen during that period as well is when we started the company, we really thought of, okay, we want to be a connectivity provider in these remote areas. So what we want to do is enable other companies like OEM, system integrators, um, these parties in, in the ecosystem that they can start and building their own solutions on top of our connectivity layer. And what we have seen, because it's still a bit early days for IoT. This ecosystem consists of all kinds of small building blocks where almost nobody can carry a solution. So instead of relying on all these other parties, we actually said, well, instead of just providing the connectivity layer, we have something unique in hand because we can provide this with a global standard, same software, same hardware anywhere in the world because we have our own frequencies. We don't have to make use of unlicensed band that change in every continent or every country you go. And with that benefit, we could actually take our own position by having this you know, complete end-to-end -end solution, no matter where you go. And we have, I wouldn't say call it the pivot or shift that much, but we expanded from just providing connectivity to actually providing the full end-to-end -end solution in, in several of these markets. And as a, yeah, we, we are just at the beginning of um, the opportunities that are arising, but also from our company perspective. So, so you just have this cusp, really. You just you're just exploring what's going on. There's just that much. There's, there's so much that can happen with this that you're you're sort of here, yeah, and and you're ready to go, sort of test level. Yeah. So we are from a company perspective. Um, you know, we, we started with the satellite business, so to say, because we're very proud of, of what we have achieved and all the frequencies that uh, that we have been allocated to the market access in all these countries that we uh, can commercially operate in. But next up is, you know, we are in the next phase of growing our company. Uh, we have over 50 employees nowadays, uh, most here in Amsterdam. That's where our headquarters is. But we have people in the US, we have people in the UK, uh, some in Asia as well. So, yeah, it, it's it's taking the market by storm while also still defining the market itself. So it's uh, it's it's a full blue ocean race. Uh, yeah. It's interesting because we're talking. We, we've talked about the tech itself, but let's talk about the business. How do you? How does someone? You know, when you've got a fantastic idea like this, how does someone take that to market? And how do you convince? You know, angel investors, as you said, um, you know, to part with their money and support you on these sorts of projects. Yeah, so it, it started out with uh, the group of investors, as I mentioned, the, the guys that pulled me away uh, from the regular nine to five jobs. Um, so with that, we we basically had our seed funding ready uh, before we had the full ID, which is tremendous luxury, uh, I must admit. But that means that the first amount of money was actually being used to get the first contracts in already, uh, the collaboration with the European Space Agency. So we, you know, we knew what we were doing. Uh, together with my background in the aerospace industry, we had all the right partners to start building up that part of the company. And um, I think one other aspect is we, we never uh, positioned ourselves as being a startup. We were not part of all the conferences, drinks, dinners, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we co-founded the company together with the co-founders of, uh, of Just Eat, uh, the guys who did Treatwell, an online booking platform. Uh, we have the, uh, the CEO of Booking.com here with us as well. I mean, it's just a team of all-stars knowing how to quickly scale companies 
through the I like that all stars. So um, your all star football team is just you you know your all star business team are just putting their brains together and creating something magnificent. I think that's really really interesting. Um, but obviously, you know, a lot of people watching this probably don't have that team of all stars. How do you get in? How do you find you know get in front of these sorts of people? You know, I'm sure there's lots of people out there with fantastic ideas such as your good self. What advice would you give them to get in front of these all stars to get their support and get their backing? Yeah, you need um, champions within within that group, right? It's a, you can call it a community, you can call it a uh, an angel environment, or you know. But it's really on a uh, who knows who kind of basis as these kinds of things work. And uh, I tried it as well with, you know, sending uh, emails to info at vc.com, uh, whatever the VC name is, uh, zero replies uh, until you, you know, you meet them in person and you have the, the reference checks being done. And once you get in, you know, it's kind of like a snowballing effect. Um, so, yeah, th there's a lot of luck involved. Uh, cannot say otherwise, unfortunately. But yeah, uh, it is about being in the right place at the right time. Exactly. And in front of the right people. Uh, you know, and, and this is something we always talk about, networking. Go out and network. Meet people. Some, someone already always knows someone. And it's about building those connections, those chains, going through and getting in front of people. Um, maybe one day my connection with your good self may lead me to some some great angel investors who knows you know and, and one of the things we say to people throughout the festival of enterprises when you come to an event like the event we normally have in normal times where you've got some of these entrepreneurs um you know we had lord bill amoria the founder of cobra beer here's linney who's a massive angel investor and you know we say to people if if you can get in front of that person you can meet that person you can have the right conversation with that person exactly. You just have to say the right thing that's going to say for them to think, hang on, you know what, that makes sense. I'm interested in this. Tell me more about it. Because investors, especially angel investors, they're always looking for that, that click that's going to make them think, you know what, this is what I want to get involved in. Because business owners have a desire to keep growing. Mm -hmm. And they might not necessarily have that within themselves, the ideas, but they may have the funding, the knowledge of how to take things to market. And everything else so i think it's really important you know you talked about that it's about networking face to face yeah exactly and, um, one of those aspects as well is you know the the number one thing these angel investors will invest in and topic two number three as well is team team and team you know usually these angel investors have been entrepreneurs themselves they know and they can help you guide with you know building up a company but they have to trust the team. And, you know, we, we were in a somewhat of a luxurious position to start with. That's definitely true. Yeah. But nonetheless, you know, you, you execute upon, uh, on, upon the plan and also compare to what the market is doing. We have probably a, a handful of competitors around the world. And one of the, the maybe even funny examples is, you know, we worked our butts off from day one till today and um, one of the, the funny anecdotes there is uh, we are working with frequencies uh, we transmit data uh, from a satellite so it's not only the the space side but also the element of allowing data to flow in and out of your country is something that governments are not very uh, keen on on the usual basis so we have to do everything via the united nations to be allowed to actually uh, yeah to get uh, licenses to be allowed to to operate and uh, one of our competitors uh, was basically having a Christmas break where we were continuing to work and, and made all the deadlines and all the documentation in place so we beat them by one day eventually uh, and now we are ahead of them so um, you know it's a really funny way of you know you have to give it your all but you know that doesn't mean that um, yeah, how should you put that in place? I mean, you can you can work all day long, which is 
probably also not the right mindset, but I, I had a lot of fun at my at my early days as an entrepreneur, where some other people are start to ask me questions. Like, so I have a, normal. <laughs> yeah, so I have a, I have a job. Uh, when should I change to being an entrepreneur? And, and yeah. some of the VCs said, well, if you if, if I'm going to invest in you, then I want you to work part time. And part time is 12 hours a day. I don't care what you're doing the rest of the time. It's of course a bit of a US uh, mindset, uh, most likely. Uh, yeah. I always tell the team here differently because I want my employees to work within working hours, and I really believe in that uh, work-life balance. Yeah, I think you've got to, you. I think it's an interesting one. You've got to work hard. You can't. You know, my motto is: you work hard, you play harder. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm away here. You know, I've come away because I needed some time away. Sometimes you need that headspace, and and actually, when you're away, you come up with ideas. Uh, and I, and I think you know, time to yourself. You need you need to you need to refresh because you get burnout, especially mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. When see what happens as an entrepreneur, it's like riding a bike. You learn to ride a bike, and you keep falling off, and you keep falling off. But you need to remember that you know eventually that cycle is going to keep going, and you're going to keep pedaling. And you're going to learn to put the brakes on and you're going to learn to stop and get on and off without falling down. And you're going to take those state. You know, I think some people don't have stabilizers. Some people, you know, if you think about it, if you, if, you know, you compare a normal startup to your good self as a startup, you know, you already had the seed investment. But then there's some people who don't have the seed investment, so they don't have the stabilizers on the bike. They're having to go straight into it. So... I think you know there, there has to be that balance, and and it's good that you you've sort of mentioned that that you know you you do want your team to be working hours, not constantly working, because burnout's really you know can have a really detrimental effect on a business. Because if you get burnt out and, and you lose interest and you lose passion and vision, you 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 can go nowhere. Yeah, and especially in, in the way we work nowadays, where almost all of us are at home. Uh, we have uh, special measurements here that about, I think, 15% of the people can come in. Uh, we still do yeah. a lot of work with hardware as well, so some of the people have to be in the office. But nonetheless, uh, instead of burnout, I think there's a new uh, definition being zoomed out nowadays. <laughs> zoomed out and digital fatigue, out. we call it. Sorry? Digital fatigue. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, being able to always be available just doesn't work. I want there to be for my team, but I, you know, I want them to reply uh, within the working hours and take time off or you know, take the uh, little walk. Yeah, because I mean, we all have families. We all have people we've got to you know respond to outside of work, and it's important that you know what. If you ask the question, why do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, why does an entrepreneur? Why is an entrepreneur an entrepreneur? Because they want to earn a lot of money. They want to live a good life. They want to make a difference. Now, all of those things can't happen if you don't have your health. Yeah, there's always the doubt. But you do trigger a nice point, though, because if I look at my own career from, you know, uh, I used to play tennis when I was very young uh, at an acceptable level. That's uh, let me be a bit uh, timid here. Um, but going, you know, through the career, doing aerospace engineering while not being good at math, uh, I, r I really had to uh, find ways to, to go through all these tests. Um, and eventually, uh, you know, investment banking, m and is think, seen as the top sports of, uh, of business, especially when it comes to the hours. Yeah. Um, to now working for my own, you know, the number one thing that drives me is the opportunity to have 10x or more kind of impact on yeah. uh, the things that, that we're working with. So... Maybe uh, it's more the generation just below me, as as I've been uh, as has been explained to me. But the fact that we can make sure that you know forty percent less truck rolls are available or required to do the same kind of fulfillments of of tanks and silos, yeah. Um, that we can make sure of that people know where the stuff is. Uh, yeah, the benefits are just so big. That, yeah, that, you know, that that drives us forward, and uh, and I'm very happy. Uh, although it sometimes leads to uh, to tough decisions and, and tough discussions here at the office as well. But you know the team really stands behind that. Like we want to have a greater impact on the world, 
making it a better place to live, to a better place, not only for the, to the human, but, you know, we can, if you want to expand it to a grander vision, as you, as you asked previously. Yeah. You know, the, the, the climate um, um, monitoring possibilities that we yeah. have with very local measurements and just rolling out that everywhere so we can hold countries or companies or institutions accountable for the pollution that they are providing because we have the measurements in place you know you can show yeah. them that we that 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 comes from there and um, there's no stopping to this kind of uh, this to this kind of business model and that that is something uh, i'm very excited about to continue growing um continue to go international and funny thing is on day one because our satellites you know they they go around the earth 16 times per day uh, at quite some speed as you then can imagine um, but they see the whole earth at least once per day so by default we have a global business at hand brilliant so uh before i let you go Cohen, um we've got a few questions mm -hmm. um so i'm going to do a quick quick fire question with you um so the first question is how much is iot benefiting from 5g and what impact will it have in the future i think that 5g is a, a tremendous next step um it really shows how how they can yeah benefit and enable your life to um you know when it, when it comes to driving cars or uh, having data available on the spot uh, i think it's a, a great invention and i very much look forward to having that uh, available uh, anywhere possible in in a safe environment of course there's quite some discussions on that topic as well nonetheless um, we go into what, the 5g conspiracy <laughs> theories today i just yeah no so i i uh, i appreciate that what we have seen though with you know, from 2G to 3G, nowadays 4 um, and, and 5 is upcoming, is because the frequencies are going up, and I'm talking a bit technical here, but because the frequency is going up, the amount of power required to cover the same area is going up as well. And the only way to, to keep that uh, coverage expanding is by building way more towers to have all those antennas installed. Well, so therefore, I don't see that 5G is any uh, any uh, competitor or anything that we have to worry about from, from Hybris' perspective. I actually think that as soon as more companies and, and people are aware of the fact that apparently you can measure everything anywhere all the time, you want that in the remote areas as well. So it will just boost our own business. So I'm very happy that these kinds of advanced technologies are coming in. Um, we do focus on the, the low power elements though. So 5G is, is basically bursting with more power than, than you ever have seen before. Um, but I don't see it as a competitor. I, I really think that's a, a great boost to uh, data in general, but especially also for hybrid on the, the low power elements of it. Brilliant. Uh, next question is, is there any sort of standardization or compatibility within IoT industry? Yeah, that's a good one, because I think everyone is trying to do their own thing um, and therefore defining the next standard again and again and again. Um, uh, hopefully, narrowband IoT can do some uh, standardization there. Uh, hopefully, there is uh, one protocol that works uh, for all these uh, antennas, uh, etc. Nonetheless, um, you know, the beauty of, of what we have um, developed till date is that we have our own sliver of the spectrum. And therefore, our, our protocols work everywhere around the world. So having that opportunity really standards, yeah, standardizes the technology around it, which is required to, to give the IoT uh, industry a boost. Uh, next to the ecosystem discussion we, we had earlier in this interview. Okay, brilliant. And uh, I've got one last question. And as you know, a lot of the people that watch our webinars and are engaged in our webinars are small business owners. Uh, and the question we've got is, what 
you know, how can IoT be used in a small business for remote working? Yeah, so that, that's a, a very good one. You know, we, we enable tons of companies with their business as, as they uh, basically get to know simple status updates on where their assets are, where their fleet is, um, you know, what their tank levels are, all these kinds of things. The things we are not doing is compete with broadband internet. So it's not about having tons of data uh, directly available to you because that already works with fiber. There are already broadband satellites out there and especially with Starlink and, and even Amazon providing that kind of constellations in the near future, we really thought of the niche market of, of low power IoT solutions. But when it comes to businesses, um, you know, especially those that, that have assets in remote areas, you can start with just a few euros a year providing connectivity there. And then you can yeah. build your own solutions on top of that. that. That's really the business model, how we started that. Well, that's interesting because I think a lot more people now are moving out of the cities and they are going into remote areas because they don't need to be in a city <laughs> anymore. So they would rather be in a remote area, in a nice cottage, in a small village somewhere where connectivity is probably really low. So I think, you know, that could be a way of getting where it would benefit some small businesses if they are operating in that sort of fashion. Definitely, yeah. Brilliant. That's everything from us today. Is there anything you want to finish on? Yeah, yeah I'm just extremely proud to be uh, to back with your team. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and uh, I really like these kinds of festivals. And, um, and you know, I wouldn't say surprised, but more empowered again to see that you guys keep on going, even in this pandemic, uh, and showing the world how actually how easy it is to to get you know going in these tough times so uh, thank you very much well for, it's interesting uh, i think you know when we started this um myself alex and the whole team you know lockdown what does that mean you know we're, we're in an industry where we have to meet people face to face that's what we do we put on events where people network and meet each other face to face how do we you know change our business and very very quickly we realized that we had to keep ourselves relevant in the market mm -hmm. in order to survive the pandemic because many events industry many events companies have just died of death mm -hmm. but we've actually thrived because we we knew what people needed people needed content they needed support they needed new ideas and we were able to provide them with that just in a different format and that's what we've done and that's why you know having fantastic conversations with people like your good self who are able to share such knowledge um with other people it is just amazing. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for tuning in on this miserable Tuesday morning. And hopefully the weather will get better and uh, you know, you'll be able to enjoy the bank holiday weekend this weekend. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.